Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sabir, and I direct events here at The Strand. Before we launch into a discussion of Lee Goodkin's new memoir, My Last 8,000 Days, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on Fourth Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until, after over 93 years, The Strand is a sole survivor, now run by third generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers, authors like Lee and Vivian, we wouldn't be here today, and we are so appreciative of it. So tonight we are excited to have with us Lee Goodkin to celebrate the release of his new memoir, My Last 8,000 Days. Lee is the founding editor of Creative Nonfiction Magazine and an architect of the genre, as well as the author and editor of more than 30 books, including You Can't Make This Stuff Up, The Complete Guide to Creative Writing, to Writing Creative Nonfiction from Memoir to Literary Journalism, and Everything in Between and the Art of Creative Nonfiction, Writing and Selling the Literature of Reality. Joining Lee in conversation is Vivian Gornick. Vivian Gornick is the best-selling author of several books, including the acclaimed memoir, Fierce Attachments, named the, best memoir, named the best memoir of the past 50 years by the New York Times Book Review in 2019, the essay collections, The End of the Novel of Love and The Men in My Life, both of which were nominated for National Book Critics Circle Awards for Criticism, and The Odd Woman in the City, the Odd Woman and the City, apologies, a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award for Autobiography. Her newest book is Unfinished Business, Notes of a Chronic Rereader. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Lee and Vivian to the stage. Hi, Vivian. This is Lee. Hi. How are you? I'm good. I, I want to just begin by um, thanking Sabir Sultan for um, 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 agreeing to do this event and thanking the Strand Bookstore for all of the years it has serviced the writing and reading community. Um, it's been, um, and, and it's a, and this is my publication day for my first novel and I'm incredibly excited. And, um, and it's, it's just been a, uh, uh, a great lead up to uh, to October 1. This is it. This is something I've been waiting for for a long time. And so, um, and um, uh, Sabir just gave a terrific introduction to Vivian. And I got to say that um, if someone would have asked me um, a long time ago or, 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 or a couple of weeks ago, what writer would you like to spend some time with that you do not know that, um, that you could just sit and talk to and relax with and, and maybe drink some wine with, um, it would be Vivian Gornick. Um, uh, who I admire so very much. Um, um, uh, yes, Fierce Attachments it, it won many awards and it, 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 um, it is the best uh, by the New York Times um, memoir in the past 50 years, but The Odd Woman from the City just turns me on. It's just, I think it's such a lovely book. And so um, who, whomever hasn't read um, uh, on uh, um, that book should um, should buy it immediately and uh, and meet this incredibly interesting character named Leonard. Uh, so um, so so I love that book and um, and I'm so happy to be here. So thank you, Sabir, and thank you, Vivian, and um, thank you, Strand, for um, for for making it possible for me to celebrate this publication day on October first with Vivian. So. Let me begin by, um, uh, uh, before we get into our conversation, I want to tell you about another, a series of interviews uh, or of, of emails I got, a uh, couple of emails I got over the last couple of days, which kind of reflects what my book, uh, My Last 8,000 Days, is all about. Um, I got an, uh, an interview, a, sorry, an email a couple of days ago from an NPR reporter, an NPR affiliate, affiliate who had introduced, who had interviewed me a few days before. And he wrote to say, I thought you were 77 years old, but I looked at your re Wikipedia site and it says you're 70, 75. And then I got a phone call from an old friend, a guy I hadn't seen in, oh God, I don't know how many years, who also read the book. And he said, what is it with you, Lee? Are you 73? Are you 75? Or are you 77? Well, he read the book. He should know. 
and the <laughs> NPR reporter, they should know that I have spent my entire life lying about my age. And um, so, so, um, so of course, I know it's crazy. And I started lying about my age when I was 40. And I can't tell you exactly why, um, but I got, uh, I, I began in this, in, in this, 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 this fr frame of mind of denial. And when I was 40, I said, uh, I said to, I wrote, I literally wrote emails and letters and phone, made phone calls to all my friends. And I said, um, okay, I'm 40 years old. I would like it if you never mentioned it again. I would like it if you just, um, um, uh, stop sending cards, stop sending letters, um, stop calling me up and wishing me a happy birthday. I want my birthday to just go by like any other birthday. And uh, so I did that. And I gotta tell you, it was a rather lonely experience when my birthday finally came around. But, um, but I, I think that that's what happened to me. And maybe what happens to a lot of folks um, uh, when they begin to start thinking about, uh, getting older, this, this aspect of denial of aging. No, I mean, we, we grow up, we're so young, we, we feel so, uh, uh, so full of ourselves. And then we begin to realize that, um, um, that pretty soon we're going to be circling the drain or we're going to be getting into the drain anyway. So, um, so uh, the first part of my book, or a good deal of my book, has to do with the denial of what is happening to me, happening to me, getting old. And, um, and getting old also, um, in many respects, means uh, loss, the loss that comes with aging. Uh, it, uh, my book is about my 70th year, or it begins in my 70th year, and I lose a lot of things in my life that were really important when I am seven, uh, as, as I have gotten older. My two best friends die, uh, one with cancer, and one was suddenly, uh, and tragically on a dark road in New Jersey one one deep one one night run over by a car and five days before my mom was to turn 794 five days before my birthday my 70th birthday my mom died who would have been 94 at that time and um, suddenly I found myself being all alone without any support system at all and as a, as a writer uh, as a writer um, you know, Vivian, maybe, maybe things are different for you, but, um, but I rely on a very few friends. Uh, I spend, as, as most writers do, I spend a lot of time staring at my keyboard and pounding away, um, uh, staring at my display and pounding away at my keyboard. And, um, and then it's not like I leave, I don't stay, I stay in my house. But when I stay in, when I leave my house, I walk around, I run, I talk to people, but in my head, in my head all the time is what I'm writing about. I can't seem to, I couldn't seem to make a connection. And um, with my friends dead and uh, my mom dead. And during that time, the, uh, a book contract that I had spent my life, I had, I had devoted a great deal of time, kind of fell apart. Um, I was in a relationship for a long time and that fell apart. And I was so, this, this, this loss that comes with aging um, led to loneliness that comes with aging as well. And, um, and just one more thing uh, about the book um, uh, that, uh, that affected me at the time. I felt, I felt really, like I said, lost and lonely and, um, and, and I look, tried to look ahead in my life and tried to figure out what I was gonna do with my life as I approached and reached and, and went past my 70, went into my 71st year. And um, I, I just didn't know what to do about myself. Um, I didn't know how to bring myself back or change my life. Or for a long time, I didn't even know whether I wanted to change my life, although it wasn't working anymore. So um, I believe that lots of folks who um, who reach this plateau or this 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 um, this barrier of age, whether it is at sixty or seventy or eighty, feel that way. That okay, I have a lot to give. 
Um, I'm not afraid of dying as much as I am afraid of losing my identity, losing my ability to achieve and make an impact. Um, I think a lot of folks feel that. And, and I felt that. And I decided to um, try to figure out what to do with my life and how to continue to move forward, even though even though it, it makes moving forward when you're 70 is a heck of a lot more challenging than moving forward when you're 50 or 40 or 30. And so uh, in essence, that's what my book is all about. My, my, my denial of age, my, um, of my age, my loss of so many of the important people in my life and, and, and my transition, how I was going to fight my way through this and come out the other side as a better person. And so, um, Vivian, you told me in an email or maybe a phone call, I can't remember. Um, um, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to use numbers here, Vivian, but I'm going to say that you told me that you were even older than I was. I and, so, um, and so, um, d d how, how do you feel about, about this aging business? Um, is it bothering you? Is it make you nervous? Um, can, I know you're a walker. You walk all the, in, in, in so many of Vivian's books, she's walking all the time through New York. Um, so can you walk? Is, <laughs> are you a good walker? Walker, Vivian, what's what? Where do you walk? I will. I walked for at least twenty years. I walked six miles a day. Oh my God! I walk about three miles a day, but I do walk every day, every single day, and um, yeah. No, actually, I, I'm afraid I don't share almost any of your feelings. <laughs> <laughs> I. Um, I never thought about my age until about two years ago, uh, and uh, and I then I only thought about it because I um, began to experience small losses of energy, not large, but small lo uh, losses of energy, or um, or even apprehension. You could or an accumulation of apprehension. For instance, all my life if uh, the light turned red and I looked up and down the street and saw nobody, no cars coming, I would always run the light. I don't do that so readily anymore. I'm not so absolutely certain uh, that I, you know, that I'll be safe. Um, I, uh, since I don't feel a huge a loss of, uh, of uh, energy and I am extremely healthy, there was no reason really for me to think about growing old. As far as losing people is concerned, in New York City um, takes up a lot of slack. <laughs> so I once brought a dinner party in Houston to a standstill by saying, if everyone I knew died tomorrow, I'd still have New York City. And I meant that and I, in, a, in an odd way, and I still mean it. In other words, the city is so replenishing so in terms of, of human connection. Uh, and I make it quite often um, that the charge of the city is ex extremely revivifying, is always revitalizing. And I've lost many people too, like everybody else. Um, and I, um, I live with it. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think of it as a measure of changing life. of um, And then I think too, hardly anybody has anything interesting to say about aid. I mean, it's, <laughs> these are, we trade these banalities over and over again. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I would write about age if I thought I could use it metaphorically, but if I can't, uh, I, I don't know uh, what really what to do with it. I'm admiring that you found your way through um, a whole book uh, in which you discuss it. Um, it is, it, I've never in my life felt um, that I had to pride myself to find a new life or to go on or to re revive in some really uh, powerful way. Um, and the city confirms me in that, you know, the city just keeps going and I keep going with it. Um, I've lived, a, you know, a long, long time in New York City. I've watched the city change a thousand times. And when I was a kid, it was a completely different city. 
everything was free or cheap, uh, safe, above all else, safe. Um, and everyone, uh, so to speak, was in their place. Uh, you look at a picture of in the 1940s or 50s of New York City, a uh, street on, uh, in Midtown, and it's all white men wearing hats. There is an, a woman in sight. There isn't a person of color in sight. There is, I mean, they're there, but they're not there, you know? So you look at that and you look at today, you look at a Woody Allen movie even of 20 years ago, and the street is filled with, with color and mass and every kind of person under the sun. Um, so I've watched the city change immensely many, many times, um, but I don't feel it. It, it never changes for me. And I, um, I never look up. I only <laughs> look ahead. I look, uh, I watch the city at, at, at eye level. Uh, that, that's my, my favorite um, position. If you, and, and in New York is famous, by the way, for being a city not of architecture and, uh, and architectural gems, and, uh, not at all. Um, on the contrary, it's a city in which everyone is amazed by the crowd. I mean, people from all over the world have written about this. And of course I have too, because that is, that is the thing. That is what the city is distinctive for, the quality of its crowd, which is not like many other cities in the world. In New York, everyone acts out. You can take a walk for 10 blocks and you come home with enough raw material for six stories. Um, it's just, and, and that keeps away a certain gross level of loneliness. Everyone who lives alone suffers loneliness. Um, everyone in the world suffers loneliness, whether, you, whether, whether you're alone or not. But certainly those of us who live alone suffer what I call gross loneliness. You know, it's just, um, it's just the bare bones condition. Um, it's, I look upon it as being closer to the existential condition uh, of life than a lot of other people are. After all, marriage, the family, uh, they are um, a stay against loneliness. That's what they're for. I mean, that is why, that's, that is why it all is. If you're not doing that, you're right up against it. So for me, the best place in the world to be is in a world capital where uh, the streets echo your life. And in New York, particularly, you know, 50% of all households in New York are single person households. That's an astonishing statistic, but a true one. Um, so you walk the streets and people, quote unquote, just like yourself, are walking them too. And there's a lot to be learned from it. So there's my little lecture on, uh, on growing old. Um, I, don't, I don't think I'll ever write about age. I used to say when I was younger, sex and death are not my subjects. Now I guess I'll add age to it. I, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's really interesting. And, and in, in memoir writing, especially your writing, as you've just pointed out, place, where you are, is really a significant factor. Yes. So um, I've written, so New York has, I don't know, uh, maybe 8 million people, maybe a little bit more. But Pittsburgh has uh, 312,000 people. And, and we used to um, um, uh, during the when when the steel industry was booming in uh, the late 1960s, the population was 760,000. And now steel is dead, pretty much, at least in Pittsburgh. And even though Google is here and Apple is here um, and Microsoft is here and we've got great universities, um, we've kind of lost our population and like i said we've got a little bit more than 300,000 people so so uh, so my book is also very much about pittsburgh and about walking pittsburgh but i don't walk um and i'm a runner i i i i do my 6 miles a day but um but there's not a lot of places to walk in pittsburgh that will bring you the the stories and the ideas that uh, that come to pass in your wonderful um uh, 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 new york city and um, it's always a, so, so, but place is always so very important, whether it's deep in the South in Mississippi or Alabama, and you're writing about your life there. Um, the place is part of memoir writing, I think. 
and um, and I've read most of your books, and and there are other there are books that come from the Middle East and from other places, but uh, you are a New Yorker, and um, and you capture it so beautifully. And I've tried to capture Pittsburgh in my book by talking a little bit about the history, and um, uh, I talk about uh, 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 Pittsburghers. Um, Pittsburghers kind of stay here, you know. Um, we. Um, uh, uh, even if we go away, we come back on, as soon as we can. It's just like home. And um, so, um, so if I mention to you uh, some famous old Pittsburghers like uh, the Commuter Bandit or the Triple Six Fix, you won't know. But everybody in Pittsburgh will know who the, compu the Commuter Bandit is. But um, so place and memoir come, come together, do they not? Oh, absolutely. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Place. I'm very lucky to have such a, um, a flavorful, colorful place to keep on tapping into. But you are too. Everybody writes well and uh, um, with, with particularity and with grace about the place they come from. Make it a very important element of any memoir. Yeah, for sure. And you do too. Yeah. Yeah. Pittsburgh. I, I must say... Um, I have no, I've had no sense of Pittsburgh at all until I read your book. Um, then I began to think, oh, Pittsburgh. <laughs> but oh. I've never been there. Uh, I don't know. I have no idea what the city even looks like. So Vivian, COVID will be over in the blink of an eye. I mean, um, I, we know that because the president says so. So, um, so um, how about we take, how about you come to Pittsburgh and we take this incredible walk through Shenley Park and through my neighborhood, Shadyside, uh, and um, I'll show you the, the sites. They won't be as, they won't be New York sites. They'll be a lot different, oh, but- um, You're on, you're on. Okay. Are, are we on? Is this good? You're absolutely on, as soon as COVID is over. <laughs> Which will happen, you know, in the next day or two. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So, um, do you have any trouble? Um, I find that as I get older, um, uh, oh, this is this is so egotistical to say, but as I get older, I think I write better. Um, are, are you? Um, um, I write differently but more reflectively, I think. But I think I'm a better writer now than I was when I thought I was a good writer at 42. So, so. so uh, I should hope so. Yeah, well, yeah, but, um, you know, we're supposed to be losing our moxie, you know, like, uh, um, um, so well, are you getting any better, uh, Vivian? Are you getting better? Are you older? <laughs> I don't think it's for us to say. <laughs> Um, actually, though, you're right, uh, in this sense, um, the one thing in the world I worry about is, lo is losing um, my mental capacity. It's yeah. the only thing that I care about, and I worry, I do worry about that. And now what's common to me and to everyone, um, not just our age, but lots of people, even in middle age, is losing words, losing names, you know, losing all that. And I'm grateful that I'm a writer because when I, when I have to uh, write something, I have all the time in the world to sit down at the desk and wait until I get the word. Um, and then I worry about whether or not that capacity, right now I feel as if ultimately if I work at it long enough, I can say what I think I have to say. Uh, if that should begin to dim or I should begin to lose that power, uh, I would feel wretched. Um, that's about all I can say. As far as getting better, I should hope so. 40 years of writing, if I didn't get better, it would be really miserable. <laughs> well, you know, we're supposed to be circling the drain. I mean... Um, well, no, I don't get that. I mean, if, if wh why do you assume, is it a natural assumption that as we get older, our wits dim? Well, if we're not having dementia, if we're not... Um, I mean, is, is that your your general sense of everyone you ever remember? People got old. My mother lived to 94. She was as sharp as a tack. Um, your mother was really cool. And, yeah, um, and many, many are. I, I, I didn't know that that was an assumption that your mind dims uh, you, um, in general. That um, as far as writing is concerned, everyone has a different history. Every single writer in the world. There are many writers who hit their their 
top stride when they're 25 and, um, and then somehow lose, lose something all the way through. Most actually in actuality, statistically and historically speaking, writers um, famously get better of all of the kinds of professionals in the world. Um, writers, more people of a great age have written th their best work in, uh, in great age. That I know. No, you know? And I agree, but, um, but, but frankly, um, I, you're, um, you're, you're evidently more confident and stronger than I am, but, um, but um, I... Um, uh, what can I do? No, um, I, I sometimes feel, um, well, th this whole idea that, I mean, the newism, the, uh, the ageism, uh, the fact that people look at you and they think because you've got gray hair and, 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 and your face is all wrinkled, that somehow uh, you're either retired or you, ha you don't have the ability to function in, in, in the way in which other people function in society. Uh, I've got to tell you, I am so tired of people looking. I have three jobs. I teach at the Arizona State University. Uh, I write books. Um, I edit and, and, and raise money for creative nonfiction uh, magazine, and and I'm so tired of people saying, um, so you must have a pretty leisurely life now. Um, you're retired, aren't you? And um, this happens to me not every um, uh, not every year, but almost every week in my life that people are asking me, how old are you? And like, you wouldn't ask a 42-year-old how old. I mean, you would, but it would be no reason to. But they look at me and they say, how old are you? Or um, are you retired? And it's just very annoying. And, and also, I don't think it's fair to people like you and me who, um, who are going to continue to um, fight our way through, um, through books and through events and through projects for as long as we can. There is this feeling in, in this country that, um, that we're supposed to sit, at, sit in the sun at our favorite coffee house, reading the New York Times or reading a book and just kind of slowly but surely fading away. What are the circumstances under which you're meeting all these people who talk to you like this? Aren't you known as a writer and a teacher where, where, you, are, where you converse and where you meet people? And people at Arizona State don't talk to you like that. That's impossible, right? Aren't no, you? no, it, it, it's, it's it's probably illegal too. Uh, so if they wanted to, they wouldn't. But, uh, no, but no, I'm just talking you about your life conducted as a writer and a teacher. I don't know what are the circumstances under which well, the circumstances are just um, people you meet on the street that you maybe have known ten or twenty or fifty or or fifteen years ago, and uh, or people who just uh, um, uh, I'm a runner, and so I can't tell you how many times people stop me and say, um, "Oh, that's really amazing that you're running at your age," oh, uh, like really. really? Come on. This is one of the great differences between a small city like Pittsburgh and a big city like New York. I doubt if this would happen to you in New York City. Everywhere I go, there's a complete mix of people, all young, every other damn thing. Uh, and certainly on the tracks and the parks and rope, you know, people our age are, are always uh, involved in. I can't imagine that happening. It's the mark of a small town. That that kind of thing happens to you. It's not. It's I. I. I certainly it never happens to me. Never. That's I, because you walk so fast. Probably. <laughs> and if you run, <laughs> uh, Vivian, I run slower and slower every year, but I keep on plugging away. <laughs> well. I just think you got to do your best to ignore uh, all that demoralizing stuff. And, uh, so, so first you're going to come to Pittsburgh and we're going to walk and, th and then you're going to see people are going to come up to you on the street and say, how old are you, Vivian? <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and then you can punch them or whatever you want to do. And, and then I'm going to come to New York and we'll walk wherever you want to walk. And, um, and I'll feel released. I'll feel like um, a, a new me because... Uh, you will. If you okay. Will come if you do come to New York. You will feel if you spend some time in the city. See, see yourself in the crowd. Um, uh, you'll see that you will feel different. Well, I know many, many people I've known over the years who decided to leave the city, 
or especially when I was watching my mother uh, grow old, many people she knew said, you know, we can't stand the city anymore, we're going to Florida. And at least half of them came right back uh, very, very quickly. My mother would never go to Florida. She said it was a stupid, empty existence, and she had adventures every day of her life in New York. And many, many people who have left the city for the suburbs or for different parts come back because they value what the city has to give them above uh, a set of, of, uh, of comforts that are taken for granted to supply all the happiness you need. But in fact, they don't supply the happiness you need. Yeah. You know, and living somewhere where you're you're bound by car culture, when you do get old and can't and uh, and can't drive um, as well, that's a nightmare. I mean, so I think every big city is much much better, much much better to grow old in a big city <laughs> than uh, than than somewhere where. Um, the the, uh, the the number even of just visual pleasures is, is diminished is small in number just to just to go out in the street in New York is a charge no matter who you are since COVID for instance and when none of us are going anywhere and have been not all these months I've been living in my apartment but every single day I work I walk I read um, you know, as I always have. Then, of course, life closes down. But every single day for many months, I met with one person or another in a small park across the street from my house. And everyone who was able to walk there did. And it, it was amazing uh, to see all the other people who were meeting everybody they knew in that little park. And so throughout these months, there has been the vividness of that kind of pleasure and um, amusement and entertainment. Um, and, you know, you, everyone's grateful for that, really grateful. And my neighborhood in particular, all through the worst of the virus um, surge was the best, the best, we had the least number of, um, of cases reported of the, uh, you know, and I think it's because we were all meeting in that little park. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how much uh, time we have. Sabir will tell us how much uh, time we have left. But but I did want to ask you about um, about memoir. And so I've written this book about uh, 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 about I've written this memoir. It happens to be my first memoir after having written about um, more than a dozen narrative nonfiction books. And it's certainly a different experience for me to, to all, all my other books kind of, um, kind of uh, dig into other people's lives and other places. And so I've kept myself out of it. And this time I decided to, uh, to, to take a risk and do a deep dive into my own life and um, and talk about the things that really affect and and scare and delight me as well, but um, but I'm wondering um, if if you look at the great um, memoirs that have been written um, and those 50 memoirs that uh, were in the New York Times article that um, where where your memoir was was. was yeah was named the best, um, so many of them, more, much more of them are women than men. And, um, and I'm wondering, um, why is it um, uh, that um, are men, uh, I mean, yes, I was afraid to out myself. Yes, it was a big deal because when I hang out with my friends, we talk football, we talk our jobs, you know, we talk about, um, <laughs> we talk about women, we talk about stuff that men are supposed to talk about. But we don't often dig deep like a memoirist is supposed to dig deep. I dug deep and, and, and I have, frankly, I have the feeling that my male friends are going to get embarrassed even talking about it. But um, I dug as deep as I could in my life um, and, 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 and outed myself as, as, as I should have and wanted to. But I'm, I'm wondering, um, at, at 70 and 72 and 73, but I'm wondering, why is it that so many memoirs, memoirs are women and so few are men? Well, you just answered your own question. Uh, in our, and certainly in our time, um, it's a commonplace, it's a cliche that women spill their guts and, and men are embarrassed and terrified of every emotion possible. <laughs> in the 19th century, we had many, many great memoirists, many. 
here and abroad, uh, men did not scruple for a minute to not write about themselves. They thought well of themselves. They thought that they were, you know, empire builders. Uh, every, every man of any bit of education felt that he was, uh, that his life counted, that his life was exemplary. People in education and philosophy and literature and in and, and every, whatever field people, uh, uh, occupied men didn't hesitate for a moment to lay down their 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 account of themselves in our time it which is a time of testimony which started with the second world war and without with with the holocaust um uh, the holocaust memoirs were mostly by men um see men involved in big big events big world events they could feel free to write, but of course they weren't really writing about themselves. But since the women's movement, since the liberationist movements, it isn't true that it's just women, but it is categories of human beings. It's feminists, it's gays, and it's blacks. These three categories of, of people have written many memoirs in these years um, because we're all testifying. We're all saying to the world, uh, we are not as you have described us, and I'm here to tell you what I really am. Uh, and that has been eaten up. I mean, it has been uh, adored. And uh, none of these books have made uh, literature. I mean, they are all mostly works of testament. And then out of it comes a few writers, a few, you know, the, among the 50, the 50 that were uh, named by the Times, or I would, uh, I haven't read them all, but I would say most of those books are works of literature in which you're not just, uh, as I say to my students, your feelings are not a subject. Your, your subject is elsewhere. You use your feelings to illuminate a subject. So I think, uh, so that's what I think about memoir writing. I think every memoir should have an organizing principle beyond one's feelings, that it should be, uh, whatever it is you feel, it should be in service to something of, of interest beyond, beyond your mother and your father, or your husband, or your wife, or your friends. Um, and there's so, there's been a huge amount. Most, most of the memoirs that have come out in the last 40 years are just, just as I say, they're like social documents. Um, but then, uh, some people have known how to apply it. Um, in the meantime, we all grew up in a world where men uh, didn't know how to utter an emotional sentiment if their lives depended on it. And that's what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. And I grew up in, a, in the same world where women didn't stop uh, complaining about who and what they were and bemoaning their lot in life uh, to a fairly well. Uh, so that's, that's why, <laughs> yeah. But now there are many more people like yourself who are writing uh, memoirs. Um, yeah, I think so, yeah. I think m many more than, than even 20 years ago. No, I agree, we're breaking out. Um, it's it's, it's kind of easier this day, these days to, uh, to talk more honestly and openly, openly with other people um, about the things that, um, that, that you really care about and that really concern you. And um, in, in some ways, maybe that's a little bit because of the internet and because we don't have to look at people when, <laughs> when, when we confess. And, and, um, and, um, and, um, and, and, and it's 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 a it's a complicated difficult world and um and everybody um uh, including men although some won't agree with this are really confused and and um don't know quite where they're going and so so writing of course as you know shows you the way so often it's like um i um, um uh, i spent uh, many years with um a, a, a uh, three or four or five different psychiatrists and um, and uh, but but pounding your keyboard and looking at uh, the words you write and 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 what what you say on the display is almost like shrinking yourself it's um, it's, it's 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 an interesting and much less um, uh, costly uh, uh, endeavor right true so okay. we should open it up to the people who are sitting there wherever they are <laughs> right uh hi Sabira, are you ready for us 
I am. I'm sorry to interrupt. That was a fascinating conversation, but I think we have a good uh, transition question. Good. So our first audience question is for uh, both of you from Susan Cushman, who asks, who are your favorite memoirists? And what is the favorite mem what is your favorite memoir that you've ever read? Lee, you wanna it's, you wanna go or yeah, 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 yeah. The, the the first memoir that really made me that made me crazy with 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 joy and um and and um and elation was a fan's notes by Fred Exley. Oh. I just, uh, I, I read it and I read it and I read it and I thought, gee whiz, this is really, you know, sometimes you read a book, sometimes, and, and, and you just go crazy about it and, and you, can't, you can't stop thinking about it. And, and, and you feel like, you feel like, I love this book and I wonder what's going to happen to this guy, this protagonist, but, but, then, but then you don't want the book to end. You want to go on and on. Um, so no, that was, uh, that's the first memoir that I remember that just turned me on like crazy. Well, that's a good report. And yes, you're right. You want to go on and on and on. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Oh, well, I, my favorite um, memoir, which comes really out of all the years of teaching, writing the stuff I write and teaching and thinking about it, is from another century. My, mine is from, is, Edmund Goss's Father and Son. Um, that is a very, very great memoir written at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and uh, Goss was a, uh, a kind of a, a, a British um, social butterfly. He was a Victorian poet. He wrote reams and reams of trash, <laughs> very ordinary poetry. But he was a gad, uh, gad, uh, gadabout in uh, London. And he knew everyone under the sun, from Henry James to James Law, everybody. Um, and he just wrote stuff that was utterly perishable. Um, and then at the age of 56, he sat down and wrote this astonishing memoir. And it became a, 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 a great, um, uh, an exemplary work for me. Uh, it's like, it, it is like a template for me because it is, as he says, the story of two temperaments of, uh, flying against each other, his own and his father's um, from the earliest birth. Is he was a son of dissenting um, uh, fundamentalists, but his father was a, an, an, unlike most of such um, um, ministers or preachers, his father was not stern, he was tender. So therefore the boy was seduced by him and wanted very badly to become the person his father wanted him to become, which he was, you know, someone devoted to the Lord, so to religion. And it's the story of how he slowly discovers himself as a literary person. And in, in essence, what I meant by um, ma making it into a brilliant metaphor is it becomes a, um, a portrait of how a person comes to consciousness, how he becomes a conscious human being who, knew, who knows when he feels he's occupying his skin and when he feels he's in exile. So uh, for me, it became an exemplar, as I say, uh, a, a work I returned to many, many times. I taught many times I, and, I, um, and I still hold it. I still hold it up to that, that um, that level, uh, I hold it up to that uh, obligation. Another writer who writes very much like him is in another vein altogether in another century is Natalia Ginsburg, who is a great, um, she has turned the personal essay into memoirish pieces of work that do exactly the same, exactly what I just said Goss does. She uses her own experience to say something metaphorically. And those are the works that I, I uh, the, the kind of work that I, that I gravitate, gravitate towards. I, I wanted to mention also Brothers and Keepers by John Edgar Wideman. Um, oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's one of the most powerful memoirs that I have ever read. And uh, John, John Edgar Wideman, it was published, I believe, around the end of the 1980s. And, yeah. um, and, and uh, John Edgar Wideman, um, uh, 
um, who was a uh, Rhodes Scholar, a basketball star at the University of Pennsylvania, um, a novelist, um, also had a brother who um, was, uh, was convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison um, in Western Pennsylvania. And um, not only is it a story of, of, of his brother, and his family growing up in a very uh, challenging section of Pittsburgh called Homewood, but it's also um, uh, a measuring uh, and reflection of guilt about how John Edgar Wideman, look how incredibly successful and important he became um, from, from this, this very difficult background and surroundings uh, in Homewood, um, Rhodes Scholar and university professor and famous novelist, um, to how he dealt with um, uh, with his younger brother and the guilt and also uh, uh, the way in which he captured um, his his feelings of of, of of loyalty to his brother who was um, for many years uh, uh, stuck in jail forever he was recently released but it's a wonderful book and um, an incredibly reflective powerful book as well no doubt sure well, those are such good recommendations. Uh, for uh, Maureen, who asked in the chat to put us to put the titles in, I'll be doing that at the end of the event, and I will probably plug uh, Natalia Ginsburg's Little Virtues because that's my thing. Ah, uh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, so as a question from Meg, uh, would you do you have any advice on the structuring of a memoir? And this question is for both Yuli and Vivian, and let's begin with Vivian this time. Do I have any advice on structuring? Well, you got to find one. <laughs> no. Uh, no, I mean, I don't have anything prescriptive, is that's what you mean. Um, I think the, 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 um, the greatest struggle is to really, really discover what you're actually writing about. Um, and that's very hard. That's not easy at all. It takes a long time, I think, at least in my experience, to really figure out what exactly it is you're talking about. And then you want to figure out the tone in which you are speaking. And uh, I, I, I believe well, structure comes last. In other words, structure should grow out of those concerns. Uh, I don't know any other way to say it. Um, uh, I, um, I've never had an easy, uh, but I've never had it terribly hard either. Once I figured out what I was doing, I, I could more or less figure out how to structure it. But it's very important, it's very important and it's very hard, hard, really hard to find. And in the end, everything depends on that, as, as odd as it is, uh, everything really does depend upon the structure serving the work. So just gotta keep writing. <laughs> this is really, uh, it's such a good question uh, and a wise question to, to answer because um, uh, I totally agree that the structure is everything. The structure really matters in the way in which you put together an essay or a book. And uh, most people don't really think structure. They think editing. And editing is different than, um, than, than structure. There should be, and sometimes there are story editors and uh, structure editors, and then there's copy editors, and it's completely different. And so, um, and, and, so uh, and, and so structure, as Vivian said, does come last in many respects because because writing a memoir is, or writing generally is like, um, it's like you're putting together tons of information, tons of stories and tons of ideas. It's like, it's like building a block of granite, a big, it's like a sculptor who starts with a block of granite and gets all of that information and all of the ideas and goes off on tons of, tra uh, of tangents in order to put together what it, whatever it is they want to say. And then, the sculptor begins to take his or her tools and begin to shape it. And it's the shape that determines what stories you use and what stories you don't use and how the stories um, uh, progress and how the characters are introduced. And so structure should always in a way be on your mind, but also know that until you got that block of granite, you got what you think you need to, in order to capture whatever it is you're capturing in your life. And then you begin to shape 
And then structure becomes so very important. And structure becomes um, your guidepost to what you leave in and what you take out and how you stop and, and develop. So, um, so it's, it's, it's an incredibly important question that, um, that most people in the end don't think about. And uh, oftentimes I get, I get um, emails and, 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 and phone calls from people who ask me, who tell me they've already written a memoir and they want an editor. Um, well, um, they think the editor, it, it's not just taking your sentences and making them pretty, but it's, it's, it's looking from beginning to end and making it, that narrative arc work from your first sentence to your last. And we unfortunately only have time for a couple more questions, but so our next one is going to be from Darren, who asks, have you written about the pandemic? Do you think it's possible for beautiful writing to come out of it? And for this one, let's start with Lee. It's possible um, uh, for beautiful writing to um, come out of um, an essay about spick and span or, or, or going to the supermarket. Yes, indeed. Um, um, so beautiful writing um, can come from everywhere. But um, no, I haven't written about the pan pandemic, and I don't intend to write about the pandemic until I can look at it from, um, from kind of a reflective distance. Um, uh, because one, uh, the, the, uh, the things could change overnight, and, um, and probably will. And two, because I've got to think about it and reflect about it a little bit more. So there's tons of writing. There's a lot of really interesting essays and articles about the pandemic now, and books, as a matter of fact, um, recently published. But no, I don't, pl I don't plan to write about it until, until the camera of my eye, the cameras in my eye, allow me to see it with uh, a more cinematic three-dimensional um, uh, viewpoint. Actually, I did write a piece about the pandemic. Um, it's in the Atlantic. Uh, it was just a small piece about how I saw uh, somebody I know who was rather misanthropic and responded with great glee <laughs> to the pandemic because she could find her way to do something useful. <laughs> Don't be so cynical. I see. Yeah, but no, th th this woman was really a, a case, and she ended up um, working through the worst surge in the in in the spring as a, um, a hospital um, uh, volunteer, and so I I wrote a reflection on that situation, <laughs> and it reminded me of many other times and places I'd been, been in and seen in which the same sort of thing happened. You, know, you, think, you think a misanthropic is gonna be the worst and very often underneath the misanthropy is a longing to, to, uh, to want to really to want to, um, to, demur to come together, uh, to, uh, to like human beings or to respond to them or to make, uh, uh, make common cause. Um, but it takes something dreadful uh, for them to uh, act. You know, war, wartime uh, scenarios are filled with that, right? You know, the misanthrope in the, in the platoon who ends up you know, crawling across hell to save uh, his buddy. Uh, so anyway, that's it. It was just that small piece on that. <laughs> and as Lee says, as far as beautiful writing is concerned, beautiful is not a word that should be in your vocabulary. <laughs> writing <laughs> um but uh expressive writing of uh, on any subject any anything uh is, is certainly possible and, and to be helped for yeah. um, so there are lots of questions asking both of you for recommendations so i'm going to call to one to make it more relevant to this discussion and the book itself which is what are some of your favorite books about books or essays about aging? Oh, I'm out of it. I'm nothing. <laughs> well, I do, have, I do have one strong suggestion, Sabir. Um, 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 a, a brilliant book by a really uh, charming and handsome writer. Um, it's called uh, My Last 8,000 Days. And, um, and, and, and it's about this, this guy from Pittsburgh 
who wishes he was with Vivian in New York, um, um, uh, Lee Goodkind. Okay. okay. We'll leave it there, right? Yep. Good idea. So thank you everyone for joining us. This was a marvelous and fascinating conversation. So much, thank you so much, Lee, and thank you so much, Vivian. I'm going to drop the link to purchase the book, My Last 8,000 Days, in the chat. So if you haven't already gotten it, you can purchase it now. And on that note, I'll say everyone have a good night and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sabir. Thank you. Thank you.